Welcome to part six of lecture three of buff body aerodynamics. So now that we see how to do the modeling of our flow, let's talk a little bit about the workflow um, of CFD. Regardless of the details of the method we're using, this workflow is pretty much universal. The first step is pre-processing. Uh, this involves discretizing the fluid region of interest, which we call the computational domain, and applying boundary conditions. Um, this require, can be human effort intensive and it requires expertise to do properly. This is something that you guys are going to learn how to do in this course, in the labs. Uh, we'll be then solving the equations. This is basically done by the computational solver. We solve the governing equations on the domain subject to the boundary conditions and the computer more or less does this without any help. Then the final step is post-processing where we have to visualize and do qualitative and quantitative analysis of the results. Again, this is mostly done by humans with the aid of clever software, and you'll do lots of this in the course too. To discretize the domain, we have to generate what we call a grid, or is also sometimes called a mesh. There are several possible techniques to doing this, but all common CFD codes use something called the finite volume method. Essentially, just basically involves dividing up the computational domain into a large number of small control volumes. And the volume integrals are then transformed to surface integrals, just like when we call solve the control volume problem analytically. And each little control volume we call a cell. And the cells can have many shapes depending on the type of program being used to generate the grid. So they can be hexahedral, tetrahedral, they can be pyramids or polyhedrons. If we are interested in resolving things in time, we also have to discretize uh, temporally. So that means we have to define a time step, basically what's the delta t from one little step to the next of the calculation. So how we do this depends on the type of numerical time integration that's being used. And there's broadly two methods, an explicit method and an implicit method. So the explicit method uses the current time step flow information to compute the time derivative term this is a direct calculation, but it's num only numerically stable for very small time steps, and I'll quantify what that means on the next slide. The implicit approach uses sort of a combination of current and future step information, so it's iterative. Um, it requires iteration at every time step, but the trade-off is that we can go with larger time steps. And typically, this implicit approach actually ends up being less expensive. A non-dimensional parameter called the current number dictates the stability of those explicit schemes we just talked about. And here's the definition. It's uh, the velocity really should be the local velocity uh, strictly uh, over the time step divided by sort of the local cell size. And at every point in the domain, this has to be less than one for a stable solution. So you can imagine in regions where the velocity is small uh, and the time step it is sort of some desired value, you can need very small cells to make this work and or very small time steps. So this, this, this is, can be a very strict criteria um, and particularly flows uh, where you're interested in the details of the boundary layer, explicit schemes can be prohibitively expensive. For the implicit approach, uh, the stability of the solution should generally be okay even with large time steps, but the accuracy is, of course, affected. If the, time if the time step is so large that it's sort of skipping important physical time scales, then the accuracy of the solution will be very poor. So we need to have some understanding of the physics of the expected flow solution to be able to choose the time step wisely. Most common CFD software packages use implicit time schemes, but often also have options for explicit schemes. In terms of grid generation, um, most common CFD sol solvers are unstructured. This means that the types uh, and shapes of the cells and the way they're connected to one another does not need to be sort of globally defined. Um, so just to give you a, a visual interpretation in 2D here, on the left we see what would be a structured grid. Um, so the cell sizes can vary, but you see that there's sort of this, every cell is basically some kind of rectangle. Um, or an versus an unstructured grid where the cells are made of triangles and the shapes and sizes vary widely. Of course, on an unstructured solver, you can still use a structured grid. Um, you're just not constrained to having to do so. 
In general, unstructured grids are comprised of polyhedral cells. So a polyhedron is any 3D convex shape that has a number of faces uh, greater than or equal to four. Um, and a polyhedral grid allows for very efficient filling of the space um, for a given cell size or particularly a given face size compared to tetrahedral grids. And this reduces the total cell count needed. So open foam, which is the solver in SimScale, ANSYS Fluent, Star CCM Plus, these are all codes that support polyhedral meshes, some only in very recent versions. So next I'm going to explain using a sketch why polyhedral meshes are more efficient than tetrahedral meshes. Let's just look at a 2D example, so we'll think about a polygon versus a triangle. Take a moment and try to think about doing this on your own before you move on uh, and see the way I've explained it. 